and show my screen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'll just adjust my camera here. All right, good evening. Uh, I'm Elaine. I'm from the BC Cattlemen's Association. Tonight, we're doing a webinar on the Agriculture Environment Management Code of Practice, uh, often referred to as the code or the new code. Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. I see we still have some participants joining as we get rolling here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I've been with the BC Cattlemen's for 18 years, and I've been the staff person most recently to the Environment Stewardship Committee. Uh, I've recently just taken on a management role, and I'm transitioning my Environment Stewardship Committee duties over to Carly. Henniger, who is currently sitting beside me <laughs> and joining us for the webinar tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to give you a little background on BC Cattlemen's Association, our presenter tonight, as well as recognize our sponsor and uh, cover some housekeeping items. BC Cattlemen's Association is a nonprofit organization that is uh, operates on the a strong base of our volunteers on both our board and our committees. Over the last 10 years, the Environmental Stewardship Committee has been working on monitoring the development of these new rules around the egg waste management and uh, advocating for the needs of beef producers at that table. Uh, the government first released the first intentions paper on the egg waste um, rules in 2012 and at that time the association was quite concerned that the proposal was too prescriptive it was a one-size-fits-all model that we just didn't think would work for our sector at that time several ag commodities also felt the same way and joined together to have some joint meetings with the province at that time hoping to affect change and have some positive effects on these new rules it took many years of meetings that the BC Ag Council coordinated and BC Cattlemen's Association was one of the participants at the table along with the BC cattle feeders who showed up at all the meetings and had good input and they're part of our presentation here tonight as well. They're joined the webinar as audience members. Our presenter tonight is Jeff Hughes Games. He uh, has, many of you might know him for, from his years in government, working with the Ministry of Agriculture. He has recently been contracted by the BC Ag Council to help with the outreach on the new code. Uh, Jeff has been a great resource for us. Uh, tonight, he is here in that role to help us learn what these new rules are. He's not representing government. That his past is behind him. <laughs> uh, we appreciate Jeff coming and helping us tonight. Um, he is very well versed in the needs of the farming community, and he is one of the go-to guys on these new code requirements. He's been a great resource person over the years, and we're looking forward to his help as we learn these new rules. Our webinar tonight is funded in part by the Beef Cattle Industry Development Council and the uh, Beef Cattle Industry Development Fund and the Cattle Industry Development Council. Uh, we use the checkoff dollars collected by CIDC uh, to help fund some of the work of the BC Cattlemen's Association, including a webinar like tonight. Uh, 
couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is recorded, so it can be used as a future resource, a copy of the recording, as well as our guidebook that everybody might have gotten either in the mail or a digital copy that's been circulating through our e-news. Uh, that will be available. All participants are in listen-only mode for this webinar so that everyone can effectively hear the speakers. At the end of the discussion tonight, we will allow for about 10 to 15 minutes of questions that can be directed to our presenter. You can submit those through the chat box, which is included in your viewing screen. And for everyone's privacy, we will not be reading out any names for the questions. So on that note, let's begin. I will just turn my screen over to Jeff. Can you hear us, Jeff? I can. All right, I'm going to change presenter now. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen. All right, Elaine, can you see my screen? Hello? Okay, I'm gonna get started then. Um, thank you to Elaine and Carly for the introduction and for organizing this webinar. Um, I'd like to start by thanking all of you online for taking time to participate in the webinar. As Elaine mentioned, I've worked currently for the BC Ag Council and ArdCorp, and have been involved for many years in, the in agriculture in the province. I hope to be able to help you uh, as cattle producers or people who work with the BC cattle industry understand this new code of practice. Um, it is very complicated and as, you, as we go along, you'll see what I mean by that. So um, you wonder what I'm gonna talk about. Well, so, so are all the cows out there wondering what I'm gonna talk about. So here's, here's the t list of topics for tonight. Um, these are ones that had been identified by um, some members of the cattle sector and uh, by Elaine and Carly as key pieces that are important to most cattle producers. Uh, the goal here is to give you an overview uh, with some limited details. Uh, there, and as Elaine mentioned, there will be time for questions at the end. Um, so we hope to be able to answer all your questions uh, as we go along. So the, the key pieces here that I want to talk about are high risk areas, uh, nutrient management plans, the soil testing requirements that are identified in the code, um, the livestock areas. Many of you uh, will remember livestock areas that were mentioned in the old ag waste control regulation or if you've been involved in the environmental farm plan program, you're well aware of the intricacies of various livestock areas that are defined in legislation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about access to water as it pertains to the code, not so much as it pertains to any other legislation. And then a bit of a thorny topic here of re record keeping and the requirements that are identified in the code. And then we'll identify some resources and give time for question and answer. So the regulation, as Elaine mentioned, um, the, the regulation came into force in February of this year after many years of consultation. It replaces the old agriculture waste control regulation that came into force back in 1992. Um, this new regulation covers all 
farm and ranch operations in BC, regardless of the size of your operation. So it will go from hobby farms right up to large commercial enterprises, and it covers organic and inorganic and conventional and whatever other process of production that you use. There are provisions within the code that are gonna be phased in over time, and I will mention some of these, but that phase in period is as long as 10 years for some of the, the components of the code. So the first topic is these high risk areas. Um, they're identified primarily as high precipitation areas or vulnerable aquifer recharge areas or phosphorus affected areas. So they're scattered around the province. High precipitation is mostly in the coastal portion of the province, but there are some small areas in the interior wet belt. There is detailed mapping online uh, that is available that will allow you to uh, pinpoint where your operation is and whether it falls within one of these three high risk areas. The second one is the vulnerable aquifer recharge area. So many of you may understand an aquifer as being groundwater. And in the province, groundwater is mapped as being um, moderately or highly vulnerable or not vulnerable. Um, what this regulation is really looking at is moderately and highly vulnerable aquifers that are deemed to be critical, particularly related to drinking water or large drinking water sources. So there may be a situation where you have a cattle operation that is over a vulnerable aquifer uh, in terms of its, its um, vulnerability rating, but it may not be an aquifer that has been specifically identified in this regulation. There are soil conditions and other things that pertain to uh, the specifics of these uh, vulnerable aquifer recharge areas, which uh, there are many details in the code, and some of them I will talk about a little later when we get into um, nutrient management. The last is the phosphorus sensitive or phosphorus affected areas. These are predominantly in the south of the or the southwest of the province, like the Okanagan, the, the Shuswap, the Thompson. Um, but there are there is a pocket around Williams Lake and then all of Vancouver Island. And what this really pertains to is the potential for phosphorus to affect surface water and cause eutrophication and ultimately cause damage to fish habitat and to drinking water quality or recreational use of the water. So again, these, these three areas are identified on maps. And then my next slide here, uh, is a screenshot of the vulnerable, or sorry, of the, the phosphorus affected and vulnerable aquifer, uh, vulnerable aquifer recharge areas that are identified on the Ministry of Environment's webpage. This map is a composite that comes from the very last phase in period, which is, is basically 2025 so that it shows all of the aquifers. So some of these are phased, phased in over time. The only aquifer right now that is phased in, in terms of the regulation, is the Hulkar aquifer, which is the, the small aquifer north of Armstrong. Next year, there will be others that come into play. And as I say, in, by 2025, all of those identified in pink on the map will be um, in play in terms of the regulation. The brown highlighted areas is the areas that are uh, known as the phosphorus affected areas. And again, most of these phase in uh, after 2023 or 2024. Um, and to know whether you're in one of these areas, you can go to this website a link uh, and type in your address or your property identification number and and it will come up and let you know whether you're in that. The unfortunate thing about these is that you may, in fact, be in an area where you're both affected by the, the vulnerable aquifer recharge area and by the phosphorus affected area. But the main driver here in terms of the regulation will be the aquifer vulnerability. vulnerability. 
And that gets us to our next uh, point, um, which really is, is about nutrient management planning. And so these uh, aquifer areas or phosphorus sensitive areas will be part of the driver as to whether you need to, to have a detailed nutrient management plan. The other drivers are these three conditions that I've noted here. Uh, whether you have a large land base, greater than five hectares, sorry, most of you have more than that, um, that you apply nutrients. So when we talk about applying nutrients, that means you as a farmer or rancher actually take fertilizer, whether it's organic or inorganic, compost or manure and deliberately apply it to land. Uh, this isn't your cattle putting manure on the land. Uh, it's it's about you putting it on the land. So nutrients applied to the land is about you. Um, and then the last thing is in terms of triggering a nutrient management plan, what is the soil test nitrate level? And as we move through into the phase-in periods, what is the phosphorus test level? And are these levels high? So as you, you see in the, the bottom of my slide here, uh, if you have greater than 100 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen in a or nitrate nitrogen in a soil test, that will be a trigger for you to uh, complete a nutrient management plan. And then later the phosphorus 200 parts per million. For the most part, uh, as beef cattle operators, I would hazard a guess that the, the bulk of you will not be affected by the um, nitrate nitrogen concentration, unless you're, you have really intensively managed fields where you're putting a lot of manure and or a lot of uh, fertilizer on. The phosphorus areas, you may get triggered by the, the soil test phosphorus number if you have some areas that are, again, fairly intensively managed. They've had cattle on them for long periods of time you know, year year over year, and you've been using phosphorus fertilizer. So those those may be triggered, um, but the, you'll only know if you uh, have a soil test record to, to show that. Uh, who can do a nutrient management plan is another question that comes up here. Um, there are various thresholds within the regulation that talk about whether it is a qualified environmental professional. So whether that's an agrologist um, or somebody else with a license to practice in the province or an experienced person. So an experienced person may in fact be somebody that's trained but is is on the farm. So, you know, you as a, as a, a well-educated, trained person operating a farmer ranch with experience and knowledge in nutrient management could do uh, that nutrient management plan. Then in non-high risk areas, there is an opportunity to do nutrient management planning uh, just on your own with the guidance that may be provided by the Ministry of Agriculture. And so the details of this piece are going to roll out over time and the Ministry of Agriculture is providing uh, the, the support around this. Uh, really right now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get really excited about this because I, as I say, I think for the most part, most cattle producers will not likely get triggered in the need to do a nutrient management plan. There may be a few of you, but but this is something um, that as the, the regulation gets phased in, more information will be available and definitely more help. So that, that brings up this uh, question about the regulation requiring soil testing. And yes, uh, this is a real concern that's been expressed by not just your industry, but all the industry associations across the province is um, related to this requirement. And as you can see in the text of my slide, it says a person, so a farmer or rancher or a contracted individual or your custom operator that brings nutrients to your farm. If you have that happening, bringing nutrients and applying it to the land, their code says you have to have a valid soil test for that field. 
and it has to be, it says in the code, it has to be for each field. And it, it must be repeated for the nitrate and the phosphorus, it must be repeated every three years. Unless you happen to be one of those lucky people that have high levels of nitrate and somebody finds out about it, and then you have to test every year. So again, reminder, if the cattle are putting the manure on the field or if it's their horses or whoever it is that's out there in terms of animals, that they're, if they're depositing manure, which is a nutrient source, there is no need uh, on that field unless you are out there putting manure on yourself. So if you don't collect manure uh, and you don't spread manure on your fields, those fields are would be exempt from the soil test requirement. The other piece that's exempt is if you have uh, peat or muck soils, so some of those interior organic wetlands that you're haying, as long as you're not putting fertilizer on them, or even if you are, um, the regulation actually says that you, you don't have to have a soil test for those. Um, this next slide is a little bit more about the interpretation of what I think the code is really trying to get at in terms of the soil testing. What they want you to be able to do is say, I know that I'm matching the application of nutrients, whether it's fertilizer, manure, or compost. I'm, I know that I'm matching that application with the production of the crop on the field. And I know if you're buying fertilizer, you're sure making that decision somehow. But how are you making that decision, I think, is what the code's trying to get at. So in order to lessen my interpretation of this, in order to lessen the burden for you, is that really, if you're growing the same grass mix or same grass legume mix on and using the same kind of crop management practices, and the soils are very similar. So let's say you've got some of those glacial lacustrine bench soils around Kamloops uh, where you're growing a grass legume mix and you're irrigating it and you put a bit of manure on it and you fertilize it and you've got five or six fields and you're doing all of that, all of those same practices to those five or six fields, one sample that represents that practice should be sufficient. But if you move down onto, you know, closer to the river, or you move higher up in the landscape where the soil might be coarser or finer or different, or if you're growing corn versus growing uh, hay, uh, grass legume hay, then you need to start thinking about separate soil tests for those uh, separate practices and separate soils. But again, it's every, it's a representative sample every three years. There's some specific guidance about the depth of when, or, or the depth that the sample has to be taken and when the sample has to be taken. Ideally, the nitrate test is at the end of the growing season. The phosphorus test could be at any time of the year. So in terms of timing, if you're already doing uh, routine testing yourself, or you've got a crop advisor or a fertilizer agent that's doing those tests, we just need to try and shift those so that the timing of those samples are taken to be appropriate for the requirements of the code. Um, so in, if you're in a wet area, like on the coast here where I am, uh, it's really end of season, September, October. Um, there is some latitude to go a little longer or go into the spring in the interior. Um, but the guidance for that is provided again by the Ministry of Agriculture and they've got some really good details on when and where and how this soil testing should occur. Okay, moving on to the next topic. This um, one, livestock areas. This is really similar to the agriculture waste control regulation. So if you were familiar with the definitions there and the requirements there, this really hasn't changed much, but the slight changes that have been made have caused a little bit of concern, and particularly um, this has come to light in, in the consultations that uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and, and ARDCORP staff have been doing with the planning advisors that work with the Environmental Farm Plan Program. Those people have been out on the 
on the, the landscape since um, the spring with a draft planning workbook for the EFP program. And it has had all the questions that relate to the new code in it. And we've discovered that there are some concerns about the definitions in terms of, you know, what's a structure and what area has a structure and doesn't have a structure. So in my table here, if the box is green, it's fairly clear what uh, what the regulation says and, and what the intent uh, of the, the piece was all about. So in a seasonal feeding area. So this is an area where um, for the most part, you you're, you might be harvesting and you probably are harvesting grass or, or crops sorry, from that area. It's always got vegetation on it. Uh, you may be feeding in mobile bins or bunks, or you may just be bale feeding on the area, but you're definitely feeding. Um, there is confining structures in terms of fences. There probably is fences, but you know, no, no other sort of clearly defined confining confining structures as by the definition of how it, that's in the code. When we move down to grazing area, so this is more of those big pastures, the rangeland. Um, there, it it doesn't really specify again confining structures, but you do have fences on in large pastures, and you do have fences on range. Um, so there is some confusion there a little bit about that, whether there is or isn't structures on uh, pasture or rangeland. Um, definitely, that land in the grazing area is has a crop on it, whether you're growing it or whether um, it's naturally there, that vegetation is definitely a source of feed and you, but you are not actively feeding the livestock on that. Um, a subset of that grazing area is a temporary holding area. So this is, you know, where you're uh, dropping livestock off before they go get turned out on range or when you're bringing them home. Um, there definitely is a confining structure. You're probably not feeding them, but there is vegetation there uh, that they may eat. But you're you're deliberate. You're not deliberately um, providing feed or or uh, growing that crop for them. The last one is is the confined livestock areas, and and now um, the the poultry producers who have livestock outside are included in this along with you as cattle producers so be happy you've got some friends um, but here a confined livestock area is an outside area so it's not the barn it's when the the cows and chickens are outside um, there definitely is something that's confining them there so it's a fence or it's a hillside or it's a wall of a building there isn't any other structures per se. Um, it it may be covered with vegetation. It may not be. It's likely that it is, uh, and there may be feeding going on there. So th the code talks about feeding and not feeding more in terms of confined livestock in relation to um, the setback requirements for water. And I will get to those setbacks in a, in a in a minute. And then the last is a feedlot, which we all know what that is. It's a sub, but it's a, defined as a subset of the confined livestock area. And I don't think I need to explain that to you. So um, one thing about the livestock areas is that the code is in fact silent on in terms of animals inside of a building or a barn or a closed structure. So it does not talk about how you handle animals inside in terms of handling manure or anything else like that inside the building. Um, but as soon as it comes out, as soon as the animals are outside or if the manure comes outside of the building, then the code does come into play. Uh, so the, the um, Next topic here is access to water. And there's two particular components here. I mentioned confined livestock areas and feedlots. Code says no access to water. So no access to streams, water courses, ditches within those confined livestock areas. You have to provide water 
by way of waters or water troughs or whatever they happen to be. In terms of the other three areas, the seasonal feeding areas, rangeland grazing, temporary holding areas, the, the cattle definitely can have access to water, um, but there are some conditions that come into play in terms of those uh, in, and how, how the water courses are, the water and water courses are protected. So, and then I, as I mentioned there, the setbacks are required uh, for the, the confined livestock areas. The, the whole area is, requires setbacks. And in those seasonal feeding areas, when you're using, um, if you're putting bales out or you're, you're putting out uh, feed bunks, uh, there are some setback requirements related to those. And I'll get to those setbacks again, the details of that in, in another slide in a minute. Just related to the conditions around uh, grazing and seasonal feeding and, and those temporary holding areas. Really the key here is um, we need to be thinking about how we manage the cattle or how we manage their access. And if there are, are concerns, so if, the, if, if there's erosion or if there's potential for um, definite runoff leachate, anything entering a water course, we need to start thinking about moving the cattle or figuring out a way of um, managing them or getting them to access in a different location so that they don't cause harm. Uh, it still allows for the access, but what we're trying to do here, I think in the code is what they're trying to get at is, is for you to think about how you're managing, how you're protecting that water resource uh, for yourself, for your livestock and for the downstream users and, and for fish. Um, the last piece here is that the, the temporary holding area, um, this is really those areas, as I mentioned, where you're bringing bringing animals in or taking them out. They're in there for a short period of time. The critical piece here is that what you have is a, you have a really high number of animals on a small area for a short period of time. So they can definitely cause an impact. And we just, they just want you to lessen the amount of time that they're, they're there and, and potentially having that, that impact. Okay, so the, the setbacks and I should, say these are only a very few of the setbacks that are discussed in the in the code. There's a whole host of them uh, that cover all kinds of farming activities related to the application of nutrients, the storage of manure, the storage of things like wood residue that might be used for bedding, and, and all kinds of other uh, pieces that would affect other crop farmers, whether it's uh, blueberry growers or nursery greenhouse operations, et cetera. So these ones are specific to you as livestock producers and, and some critical pieces of livestock operations. So those confined livestock areas and where you're doing uh, seasonal feeding. So if there's a well and this well is regardless of whether the well is on your property or on your neighbor's property, there needs to be a setback of 30 meters to that well for the confined area. So this is, if the confined area is a fenced um, paddock area from the outside of that fence to that well needs to be uh, 30 meters horizontal distance. Goes the same for an intake. So if you know where your intake is or your neighbor's intake is, is for drinking water, uh, and or that drinking water intake is downstream, immediately downstream of you, 30 meter setback to that water source. Any other water courses, so this is a, any stream, ditch, whatever it happens to be, depending on whether you have a, a large number of animals in that confined area or a small number in terms of the density and whether you're feeding them or not, there is, uh, variability in terms of the setbacks. There isn't variability in terms of your mobile feed bunks or your on-ground feeding areas. So where you're specifically feeding the animals needs to be set back 30 meters or 100 feet from the water. And then if you happen to have a neighbor, so property boundary being your neighbor, not 
not your next lot or your next field, but your neighbor's lot, so a different owner or a different manager, then there's setbacks to that property line. Um, they're relatively small, but it, it, this recognizes that there are situations where you might have livestock in in paddocks or in, in seasonal feeding areas that are right up against the neighboring property and there just needs to be some separation of where that activity is occurring and the neighbor's property. Okay, the last one here and probably the one that you're gonna grumble the most about and, and don't get angry at me, I'm just the messenger here. And as you can see from my little graphic, Charlie Brown's pretty unhappy about this too, is this need for record keeping. So I just, one thing I want before you kind of get into the details here is I, I, first of all, I think many of you are probably already collecting records or information about what you do on your operation. And this information that you collect is probably for your own benefit, or it may be uh, being used for you to access other programs, such as, you know, your beef checkoff program. You may be collecting it for some kind of accounting tax purposes. All of that information, as long as it fits sort of the needs of the code is acceptable for the code. So you don't have to go out and create a whole new record. You don't have to go out and create a whole new place to file how many animals that you have in on your operation on a yearly basis if you're already collecting that information. But the code wants you to be able to produce that if you're asked for it. Um, so I'm gonna go through this list, it's, it's fairly lengthy. Um, but these are the key points of where the code is asking you to make sure that you have some records of this activity, you keep it for five years, and you need to have it available to a regulatory person if that person asks you for it and you have to have it available to them within five business days. So, for livestock areas. So whenever you have livestock outside, how many animals do you have in uh, in your operation on an annual basis and, and where are they located on that annual basis? So you might have 250 cow-calf pairs. So you know how many animals you've got. Um, in, the, in the fall and winter, they're on seasonal feeding areas in the in the summer they're turned out onto range you already know that you probably can produce put that on a piece of paper or you may have it on a piece of paper already if those animals are in some place where you're collecting the manure or the bedding from them you need to be able to keep a record of the amount that you're collecting it's only if you're collecting it. So if it's just out there, you harrow it and you, you know, it's a seasonal, or it's a, sorry, it's an overwintering area and you harrow it, you don't need to keep track of that. You knew that you had a hundred animals on that field, that's all you need. You don't, but as soon as you start collecting it, so you run a, you run a scraper out there or a loader and you pick it up and you're gonna move it to another field, now you gotta track it. In terms of the, any kind of mortalities that you have, so if you have a calf die or a cow die, you need to be able to keep a record of where you buried it, um, so location, how much was in that pit. So if you keep using that pit um, month over month or year over year, you need to be able to provide a volume. What went into the pit? You know, Was it just calves or was it calves and cows? Was it calves, cows and bedding manure? and what date you, you what you, date you put it into the pit. Again, if you're composting those, at, those dead stock, uh, again, where are you composting it? What um, kind of materials are in the compost? And the code asks you for weekly monitoring. So you actually, in terms of composting, whether it's dead stock or, or, or manure, you, act, you are required now to be actively composting it, not putting it in a pile out back and walking away and not worrying about it. It has to be turned on a regular basis and you need to keep a record of the monitoring. So is it, you know, was it 
was it cooking away great or you know did it catch fire or you know the local bear came and dug it up and now i don't have to worry about the marts you know that kind of thing that's the kind of notes that you just want to have um if you're required to have some kind of protective base in a high risk area so protective bases come into play in terms of per permanent manure storages or if you happen to be collecting runoff from a feedlot like an earthen lagoon um, or um, so permanent manure storages earthen lagoons or your feedlot bases you need to have some kind of information about what monitoring you did again this can be notes uh, if it actually is an earthen lagoon where it's, where it's holding liquid, there is a requirement now for a leak assessment. Temporary field storage. So if you're taking manure and putting it out in a field for uh, more than two weeks uh, before it gets spread, uh, some records of the source and type of material, a little, and some, some notations about where you put it and, and the monitoring. So this is just about you being aware of, okay, I, I know I put that manure out there for more than two weeks and I'm gonna spread it eventually um, and it's a temporary storage area. Um, if you move manure or compost off site, um, so if you're, if you're an operation that collects a large volume of manure and you don't use it on your own fields and you ship it off, I've got W5 there. So what what the regulation says is who, what, where, when, how. They want to know records. So I can tell you that we already know there's a poultry farmer down here in the lower mainland that's got in trouble from that because, yeah, as you know, most poultry farmers, if they're a broiler operation, they're shipping all their manure and, and bedding off site at the end of every cycle. This guy got audited and had no records of that of, as to who was taking it, where it was going, when it was taken. So he got a little not in compliance note with a note that they'll come back and check and see if he has those records. Um, so they gave him a bit of grace, but um, you know, it, it, there was, was a notation for him. The last two here relate to nutrient use again. So if you're applying nutrients to a field, so if you're applying fertilizer, compost, manure to a field, what was it? What rate did you put it on? What date did you put it on? Where was the field that you put it on? And what was the crop type and yield? So crop type and yield, it's uh, alfalfa, grass, hay, I get, a hundred bush or a hundred round bales off of there. That's a good enough in terms of information about the crop. It's the field south of the barns, you know, along such and such road. I put a hundred pounds of nitrogen fertilizer on there in June and then again in August after second cut. Uh, and that was ammonium nitrate. So that's, there's your information about uh, nutrient use, and then I, as I mentioned before about soil testing. So your results, when and where. That's a lot of information in terms of uh, record keeping, but as I said, for the most part, a lot of you are probably already keeping those records. So I think I um, just want to point to a couple of places where information is available. Um, there is, as Elaine mentioned, you, you've all been provided access to this uh, cattleman's um, document that is a summary of the code. Um, they, uh, Elaine and Carly put it together and it was vetted by myself and by the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment staff. So um, the information in there is solid. And as I say, it is a summary of the code. The other place that you can go is the Ministry of uh, Environment Ministry of Agriculture connected web page about the code and as you can see there's a list here of of little snippets of information about that can help you get started in terms of what you need to know and the last resource is um, with now the, an updated planning workbook the planning advisors that work in the environmental farm plan program are quite capable of being able to help you understand the needs of the code in, in relation to your operation. So I'm gonna turn, 
back to Elaine and we'll uh, try and answer some of your questions. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for uh, your thorough explanations. That was a great presentation. Uh, we will take questions now. If anybody has any, please feel free to use the chat window off to the right-hand side of your screen. To get us started, we have a couple questions that uh, we'll start off with. The first topic is applying nutrients. Do the new rules affect the use of slow-release fertilizers? So I guess that's a yes and no kind of question. Um, slow release fertilizers are still definitely a source of nutrients um, as specified in the code. The thing with slow release is that often people will think about applying them at a slightly different time of the year than they might apply regular fertilizer. So what we're concerned about is making sure that we're not pushing that application into a situation where the code would deem it to be applied in like a high risk condition. So high risk conditions really relate to the risks of um, it being affected by runoff, heavy rainfall, um, being in a situation with saturated soil or frozen or snow covered ground. So really um, just think of slow release as any other source of nutrient and then and then these pieces about high risk conditions kind of come into play. Okay, thanks Jeff. Uh, next topic is about composting dead stock. Can I still compost my dead stock in manure piles? Okay, so I did mention a little bit about composting dead stock. So the code really just talks about um, making sure that you're managing it. So it doesn't specify whether you can compost them with manure or you know old hay or anything like that. The key thing here is that if you wanna compost your dead stock in a manure pile, you have to actively manage them. So you can't just go dig a hole in the manure pile, dump them in, bury them and walk away. You need to be out there ensuring that there's some kind of active process going on, whether it's turning or managing the moisture or managing the carbon to nitrogen ratios. And as I mentioned, you need to be monitoring that. So it's not a walk away situation anymore. And I guess the key here is uh, we didn't talk really about compliance, but the, the comments from the Ministry of Environment staff about compliance is there may be audits. And I mentioned that poultry operation in the lower mainland here, they were part of a, a area-based audit where every door got knocked on, or you might be in a situation where a complaint is uh, filed. So yes, anybody, your neighbor, whether it's a farmer or a rancher or the local person down the street, could complain and the Ministry of Environment and Compliance staff could come and talk to you. And so, if, so Mr. Rancher or Mrs. Rancher, what are you doing with your dead stock? Well, I'm just burying them in the manure pile. Well, you can't do that anymore. You have to actively manage those dead, those dead stock in the, in the manure pile. Okay, that's good info. Uh, what about winter feeding? What rules would apply to my winter feeding grounds? So winter feeding grounds are considered as part of that livestock area that I was talking about. So seasonal feeding or grazing. So there's some forage on the site. There's some, the rest of the forage is, is provided. So the key points are the setbacks to water, um, the management of the, or the setback to water for the feeding areas, the management of those feeding areas. So they talk about not having high concentrations of manure. So the key here would be in those winter feeding areas to try and I know, you know, you run into situations where there's a lot of snow and things like that, but the key is to try and keep those feeding areas within the winter feeding area moving around so you don't get big concentrations of manure that might uh, lead to a situation where there's flooding or runoff that would move them off site. Okay, uh, next question is about temporary field storage. Uh, I've been stockpiling manure and can't use it all within the seven months. What do I do? Okay, so um, 
code talks about permanent storage, field storage, and temporary field storage. So there's a period of time when, you know, the sort of two weeks, that's just active movement of manure out on its way to being spread. Longer than two weeks, up to seven months, is considered to be a temporary storage location or a temporary field storage. If you leave it for longer than seven months, it becomes what a permanent storage area. And when you get into permanent storage areas, we start talking about the need for a protective base, the need for um, solid setbacks to water, whether it's drinking water or water course or property boundaries. And then it, depending on where you are if, in the province, if you're in a high precipitation area, that may require some kind of roof or cover. So leaving it for longer than seven months just means that there are, could be more requirements in terms of the code and where you're actually uh, storing that manure in the field. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question is, how do I know if I'm in a high risk area? So, um, as I mentioned, there's this online mapping tool. Um, and I guess Elaine, do you want, I can, I can flick to my slide here. Oops, sorry. So, um, this website, and I will try and open it and see if it works. Um, okay, so this is the, the province of BC's website uh, related to the code and to these high risk areas or high risk maps. So the two components are uh, the vulnerable aquifer recharge and phosphorus affected areas and then the high precipitation areas. So these are both interactive maps so if i click on the map itself it brings me to another window uh, and there's an opportunity here uh, to be able to type in uh, in the search where did it go right here type in your location um, so let's say we type in camloops just as a, a broad area. So it zooms in on Kamloops. If you, had a, if you had your address, you could type your address in here and it'll zoom into your address. If you don't have access to high-speed internet or um, want to, to do this yourself, there are, I'm gonna back out of this, there are um, also hard copy printed printable maps available of the phosphorus affected areas and the vulnerable aquifer areas that are on this site. And I'm sure that the Cattlemen's Association or the or the Ministry of Agriculture staff in your local office would be able to help you find this page and be able to print the map off that's appropriate for your location. That's great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, it doesn't look like we're getting any other questions at the moment. Um, so maybe I'll just take this opportunity to thank you very much for a great presentation, some really good information out there, getting people to know about record keeping, clarifying some stuff on soil testing and figuring out whether you're in a high risk area. Those are really important pieces to start with. Um, also, for those of you who have a copy of our MCOP guide, uh, it's also, you can download it with this webinar. Um, on the very last page, there is uh, contacts if you have questions, either from Ministry of Agriculture or Environment or uh, Compliance and Enforcement. And of course, you can also contact our office. As Jeff said, we'd be happy to help you as best we can. So on that, I would thank you so much for your time tonight, Jeff, and thanks to all the participants who joined us. As mentioned earlier, our, rec our recording will be available on our website under the Resources tab webinar series. Uh, thanks again to our partners at the Ag Council, the Cattle Industry Development Council, BCIDF, and Cattlemen's Association. Thanks and good night. Thank you.